Hey guys, back with part two of my POPs project for the month, building a loveless drop point hunter. All right, back with part two of the loveless drop point hunter build. Uh, in the first half of our POPs project of the month, we've focused mainly on the metal work. So now it's time to do the guard, the handle, all the finish work. All right, let's jump right back in. After heat treating, it's time for more cleanup on the grinder. As I said, we'll be mirror polishing blade eventually, so I want as high a grit and therefore as smooth a grind as humanly practical. The smoother my surface here, the less work I have to do on the buffer. Now, since I essentially never do mirror polishing, I experimented a little using 3M Gator Grits, 3M Trizac Structured Abrasives, which are actually a different thing, and a Norton Norax 30 Micron Structured Abrasive. Now, as people who've watched me for a while know, I'm kind of a 3M Gator Grit fanboy, but in this case, I actually like the Norton much better. It's got a smoother, tighter finish than Gator Grits do. With my sort of practice version of the knife, I'll be stopping with the Norax, but with the mirror polished blade, I go over to the buffer and start wasting large sections of my life. I mean, buffing. Wait, those are pretty much the same thing, aren't they? Anyway, I start with a sizal buff and a relatively aggressive compound to get rid of all the grinding scratches. Then I move on to a muslin buff with green compound. Now, I know there are better ways of doing this, but not to put too fine a point on it, I'm under a deadline, and this project required me to track down a lot of stuff that I don't normally use. So, yeah, kind of ran out of time on that. The end result worked out fine, but it was way more work than it should have been. Today's video is, of course, sponsored by Pops Knife Supplies. Pops has everything you need for knife making, uh, steel for both stock removal guys and hammer bangers, huge supply of handle materials, including all kinds of wood, bone, antler, horn, micarta, just all kinds of cool stuff. All sorts of abrasives, including every kind of belt you can think of, sandpaper, specialty abrasives, compound, all that. Fasteners, tools, I mean, I could just go on and on. And if you're following along with the build, of course, we're going to be using supplies that we got almost exclusively from Pops. Next, using a couple pieces of 8th inch rod, I'll mechanically attach the guard to the blade. Two short pieces of brass rod are inserted through the pinholes and then peened down to lock the guard on the blade. You want about a sixteenth of an inch of extra material to get sufficient expansion to lock everything in place. If you do this right, you'll also close any gap that exists between the guard and the blade. But, did Bob Loveless stop there? No, he did not. I don't know if he established this as the fashion at the time, or if he got the technique from other makers, or if this was common in commercial knives, I just don't know. But anyway, the next step was to run a bead of solder around the base of the blade. Since this is about as far from my wheelhouse as a knife can be, I literally never solder guards. In fact, I hardly ever make knives with guards at all. And when I do, I don't make this particular type. So, the first knife was more or less a practice run so that I could get the second one to work right. I used a flux intended specifically for this kind of application, along with a no-lead, low-temp silver solder, both available from Pops. The idea here is to clamp the knife blade up in a vise, apply flux to the joint, then heat the base with a torch until the solder begins to flow. I'm just using an El Cheapo burns o matic torch. Once it gets hot enough, the flux will start to bubble, and at that point, you need to apply the solder all the way around the joint. If you do this at home, don't get confused and use what is generally referred to in the jewelry trade as silver solder. It's not the same stuff. It goes at much higher temperatures and it's just not suitable for this application. This stuff is a lot closer to plumbing solder than it is to jewelry brazing solders. The standard technique is to apply a pretty fair amount of solder to make sure that every crack and crevice is filled, then quickly cool it in water before the blade overheats. 
With a blade like this, there's plenty of time to get the solder flowing before too much heat gets up into the blade and ruins the temper. Then, using a little brass rod with a bevel ground onto it, you scrape back the solder to produce a nice, clean fillet. Since this was the only part of the build that I literally have never done in my 20-odd years of knife making, I was a little apprehensive, but by the second attempt, it was reasonably easy. There was also a little flux clinging to the bottom of the blade, but I quickly scraped it off with the brass rod before any of that flux could etch the steel, then cleaned it up with some thousand grit sandpaper and buffed the joint a little. I was afraid that it was going to end up looking bad, but the whole thing just completely disappeared under the buffer, leaving a really nice clean solder joint. Now for the handle. Like I said, I don't know if he was the guy who originally introduced it to the knife making world, but Loveless was well known for using micarta along with contrasting colored fiber spacers. Alan at Pops, who knows way more about Loveless knives than I do, suggested using this classic OD green micarta along with red spacers. I also used some cross-cut micarta, another Pops specialty, for the second knife. For the first knife, I'll use loveless bolts. Guess who invented them, or at least adapted them for knife making work? Yeah, that guy. You'll see how they work in a minute. In the second, I'll use Corby fasteners. Just so you know, I personally like Corby fasteners much better than loveless bolts. Anyway, in one knife, I assembled everything at once, while in the other, I glued the fiber to the scales beforehand, which made the final glue up a little bit simpler. As a result, I prefer the latter approach, but they both work. First, I ground a very slight angle in the face of the micarta, exactly matching the angle of the tang taper. That allows you to get a perfect mating to the back face of the guard. Then I cleaned up the micarta and the fiber spacers with acetone, scuffed up the micarta and spacers with heavy grit sandpaper, and blew it off with compressed air. Meticulous preparation like this will keep things from delaminating later on, which is a disaster. Then I glued and clamped everything up. So here's the handle drilling process. First, remember that the blades are tapered. So when you put the handle scales in the vise, make sure you cant them at the same angle as the tapers of the tang so that the bolt holes run true. In other words, you want the center line of the blade parallel to your vise. I most definitely wouldn't have forgotten to do a thing like that the first time around. But, you know, somebody might. The key thing about drilling handle scales, especially if you're mating up to a guard like this, is that if any of these holes is the slightest bit off, your scales will be off, they're not going to mate properly with the guard, it's just going to be really bad. So first I clamp everything in, then clamp the blade to the scales. Using the blade as a guide, I drill holes in the scales. Drill the first one, and then insert an old drill bit as a locator pin, then drill the second hole. For some reason, I forgot to turn the camera on for about half these holes, so you'll see some phony looking shots here where I pretend to drill them, but the sequence is right. Pin holes first, thong tube last. Then you flip everything over and more or less repeat the process. Again, very important that the scales are butted up really firmly against the back face of the guard. If you don't do that, you'll end up with this big ugly line where the two meet. Now in both the case of the Corby fasteners and the loveless bolts, there's a shank and a head, so you have to use a step drill to drill out the countersink for the head. Then I'll hack off the excess with the bandsaw. There's a temptation to be really meticulous here and try to hug that line perfectly, but look, it's easy to take too much off by doing that, and then you have to do a lot more grinding in the long run, and you might even mess up the lines of your knife. Now time to glue everything up. I'm a big believer in doing a test run beforehand just to make sure everything's working right. 
You will never feel more stupid than having your epoxy starting to set when you realize that you screwed something up and it won't fit together. So I actually set up everything in order here so that I can work left to right and have the whole thing in sequence. I always try to make the maximum provision for my own stupidity. Also, you want all your screwdrivers, clamps, solvents, paper towels, all that stuff ready to roll. If this whole process seems a little anal, it's because I've screwed this up enough to know that being prepared saves you a lot of heartache. 30 minute epoxy is the bomb. It's hard to get a hold of 30 minute stuff these days, but Pops has got the hookup. After letting the epoxy cure overnight, I'll head for the grinder. After getting the excess hogged off, I'll use Loveless's technique of shaping the palm swell with the large contact wheel. Once you've got the basic thicknesses worked out, you can kind of rock the knife on the wheel to start rounding off the handle. I'll clean up the interior curves using the small wheel grinder. Finally, it's on to the slack belt attachment to smooth everything out and make it all flow. Never use hard back belts like X weights for this part of the process. They'll just dig in and mess up your handle. You want really soft, flexible J weight belts like this Hermes 220 grit. Once everything's flowing and smooth, I'll do a little hand sanding to get the last few little facets out of the handle and make sure everything's nice and flowing. I'm just using strips of 600 grit abrasive to do this. Last whack on the buffer and we're done. All right, guys, that about wraps it up. Two slight variations on the same iconic blade. This is the first mirror polished knife that I've done in decades. It's the first hollow ground blade that I've done in, I mean, probably a decade. Um, and you wanna know something else? This is literally the very first tapered tang blade that I've ever made in my life. So uh, yeah, this might be the last time I'll ever do a knife like this. Uh, by the way, if you want to pick up uh, either of these knives, check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com. As always, thanks to Pops Knife Supply, and see you soon. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com.
digging the channel you can support our video making efforts on patreon you know i've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years so i hope you'll show some love for all that hard work link in the cards and descriptions finally if you're interested in making japanese swords check out my full line of japanese sword videos where i show how to forge japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings handles and scabbards walter sorrels blades dot com.